Welcome to the Australian Water School, the home of demand-driven industry design training for the global water sector. Hi, welcome to today's webinar called Escape the Concrete Jungle. We're going to try and escape today and uh, look at a few alternatives to some of the things like you see behind me here. Um, I'm joining you today. My name's Cray, joining you for the first time in several years from the US um, after a couple of years of travel restrictions. So I'm here in Boston at the moment uh, in the midst of the uh, banks of the River Charles, as you hear in some of the songs, and the Muddy River. Uh, love that dirty water. It looks pretty clean to me so far here, but we'll talk about some rivers that are not so clean um, today's uh, on today's webinar. So we've got a uh, all-star cast for you today um, joining us to discuss um, large-scale and small-scale urban river restoration or revitalization projects. Um, today in the U.S., um, well, across the Americas, it's um, El Dia de los Muertos. So um, for those celebrating that, um, I've seen a few celebrations around. Um, welcome and hope you're enjoying your celebrations. Um, we just had our first Halloween in the U.S. in several years. So um, hope everybody had a safe and happy Halloween. Our thoughts are with those who, um, who uh, with that tragedy that's happened as well um, at the moment um, worldwide, because we do have a worldwide audience here. So um, welcome to everybody um, uh, from around the world. Um, let's have a look at uh, where everybody's joining us from. Um, I think we've got um, several hundred um, uh, attendees today, uh, worldwide attendees, and um, we hope uh, that uh, for your part of the world, um, you can share some of your experiences as well in the chat line um, so that we can all learn from each other and help make this a great experience for all. So if we could um, welcome our presenters, Brad, Lauren, and Ruben, uh, I'd like to Give you a chance to introduce yourselves tell us a little bit about your careers we are going to as you saw in the thumbnail for this um uh, for this webinar we're going to be discussing uh, the la river as a case study and then we'll talk about things that are on a little bit smaller scale uh in australia and elsewhere um and what what can practically be done when you're constrained uh in an urban environment um hydraulically and uh, also with waterway health. So um, welcome to all of you. Um, let's start with Brad. I see you first on the list there and coming up first on my screen as well. Um, Brad, if you could just give us an introduction. Uh, Brad's first appearance on our um, uh, webcast was uh, last month, but he's been doing these. He's a, uh, got a long standing, standing podcast as well. You might want to make a quick plug for that to let us know what you do and um, how long you've been doing it. And then um, we'll take a vote at the end, like we saw in the poll and compare it to others. Uh, Get everybody's favorite uh, L.A. River movie. Um, so that we'll, we'll we'll move into that. Um, let's hear from you first, though, Brad. Yeah, I'll chime in first and say it's got to be Grease, a uh, favorite L.A. <laughs> channel movie. Um, look, yeah, I'm, my name is Brad Dalrymple. I'm a uh, environmental engineer, promotion protect. Um, been doing that for about well, 20 years now. Environmental engineering. I feel a little bit out of my uh, expertise uh, in this webinar. I obviously some esteemed colleagues joining me today presenting, but I know actually quite a few are in attendance. Um, so I'm actually going to pinch a lot of the photos that people have provided me over the years as well. Um, so looking forward to talking about some local Australian examples of uh, escaping from the concrete jungle. Excellent. But yeah, uh, sounds good. Shameless plug, plug for the podcast. If you like Cray, yeah, Ocean Protect podcast. Everyone get out their phones and subscribe to the Ocean Protect podcast. Uh, do yourself a favor. And if you're not sick of my voice uh, by today, <laughs> um, please uh, dive in and listen in. 130 episodes. I, yeah. I, I highly recommend it. Um, in going to the gym, uh, sometimes I just listen to, uh, you know, talk shows or whatever, but um, I, I put on some of those episodes and it will, uh, it will improve your life and it will improve the world uh, as well if you're able to take some of the lessons learned and the expert presenters that they get on that podcast. Um, you know, it's, it's something we can certainly all uh, learn from. Um, Lauren, you're next on my list um, uh, as far as uh, who's up next on the screen. So let's hear from you. Tell us a little bit about your career and um, what got you involved uh, with the LA River, which we'll be hearing from you about today. And then again, let's uh, let's hear your favorite uh, LA River movie. Okay, thanks so much. Um, yeah, I'll I'll start by saying that uh, it's probably Italian the Italian job. <laughs> okay, um, let's start up. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm Lauren Coe. So I work at the Los Angeles district in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, we have like O and M responsibilities for a for a portion of the Los Angeles River, and so. Um, I'm a hydraulic engineer and my involvement with the Los Angeles River, um, specifically the ecosystem restoration was I was the high, or I am the hydrology lead um, for updating the, the hydrology for the LA River. 
Perfect. Okay. And over to you, uh, Ruben. <clears throat> Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ruben Sasaki. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here to talk with you all. Um, I guess most important is the movie, right? So <laughs> out of the ones that were listed, I'm going to say Italian drum. You know, the little car is coming out of the culvert is probably awesome. It's pretty neat. So, um, so yeah, um, I'm a hydraulic engineer. Um, I've been working for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers here in the Los Angeles um, office for about I think for about 14, 13, 14 years. Um, my involvement for the Los Angeles River um, Ecosystem Restoration Project was, um, I was involved in the, um, what they call the feasibility study. So, and that was essentially kind of evaluating different alternatives here that we were, that we can look at and we can implement. And so that was there, so that was back in, I think around 2015. And then now, um, as Lauren is kind of the, the lead hydrology person, um, for the LA River, um, I'm, I, I am now one of the reviewers um, for this project. So thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. Excellent. Well, thanks so much. Um, if uh, we'll, we'll get started with your presentation as well, if um, Ruben, if you and Lauren can start sharing that in the background. But while we're getting that going, let's have a look at the uh, the poll results. Now, the first question is the boring question we always put up there for everybody, which is what sector you're coming to us from. That is important for us to know. We do want to know um, where you know where our audience is coming to us from, and we have a lot more government policy planning people almost competing with commercial consulting, which is almost always out in front. Um, but uh, that that's, uh, that mix does give us a little bit of a good feel for. Or, um, who's attending and how we kind of uh, direct our uh, commentary. Uh, but look at this, Tran uh, Terminator has come out on top. Now, I may at the end of this uh, presentation show you a couple of things. And I think the scene that everybody thinks is in the LA River in Terminator is actually a little tributary of it. Um, and I was just there last week, uh, took a couple of shots of that. So, um, but there are some LA River scenes as well. And so it's pretty good, pretty good mix here. Um, and what I'd invite you all to do uh, in the chat line, again, just to keep this some, you know, some good fun here is um, if you have a, one that's not listed, and there are, I think, about 100 of them, um, if, uh, if you've seen these, uh, any of these movies um, and want to, to list that as your favorite, um, go ahead and put that down. But if your favorite was not listed, uh, put it in the commentary and let's hear everybody's uh, feedback on that. Um, so that's, uh, it's just something that um, I'll probably share a, a few uh, additional slides of. Um, uh, again, from a, a site visit that I was on last week, just going out back and forth to different ends, uh, all the way to, from the downstream end to the upstream headwaters um, of uh, some of the LA River tributaries. And um, I'll just sh show you a few of those things at the end during our panel discussion. So uh, with that, um, let's go ahead and uh, turn it over to uh, Ruben. I think Ruben's gonna start us off um, and uh, Lauren's gonna assist as well um, with some of these slides. I wanna hear a little bit about this. And one of the reasons this <laughs> excites me about the Los Angeles River uh, ecosystem restoration project is this is one of the things that actually got me to Australia to begin with. You've probably heard, you know, I come on with these Australian water school uh, broadcasts and I don't have much of an Australian accent. And some people ask why, why there's an American involved in this. Um, I came out about 15 years ago and that happened after my boss went out to uh, the International River Symposium in, uh, in uh, I think in Brisbane and uh, presented some things and they showed, uh, hey, here's what we're going to do with the LA River. Um, you know, what the Corps has in mind with, with the city and the, the local sponsors. Uh, and some of the Australian uh, um, councils and others watching that um, thought, hey, this might be a, a good opportunity to take some of these lessons learned and apply them to some of the Australian creeks, perhaps at a smaller scale. And that was one of my first missions coming out to Australia to try to uh, help out with that sort of thing with uh, river restoration projects. And so I'm very curious to see what has happened in the last 15 years since I was aware of this project. I've been kind of out of the loop since then. And so, yeah, give us, let's hear an update and some of the challenges involved in trying to get uh, uh, green, greenify and uh, make it turn a, a healthier um, river environment for the waterway uh, when you're constrained by these uh, urban factors. So over to you, uh, Ruben. All right. Thank you very much, Craig. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, so um, Lauren and myself, we're going to talk about the Los Angeles River um, ecosystem restoration. Um, let's kind of go over our outline here. All right. Um, yeah, we'll give you a brief history. Um, we'll kind of give you a project background of, you know, where this is actually located. And, um, and then we'll focus on really kind of kind of the features that we have in this ecosystem restoration project. And then we'll talk about kind of the, some of the H&H &H modeling that is taking place. All right. 
Okay, so back over to me, Lauren. <laughs> I'm going to uh, just give a brief background or a, br a brief history of the Los Angeles River and um, kind of where we got, how we got to the, you know, engineered urbanized channel that we have today. Um, and so we're going to kind of start our timeline in the 1800s. Uh, you know, at that point, the Los Angeles River was a, a natural river free to, you know, meander and change course. Um, and it did change course probably about, uh, I think, 10 different times. The first of the, or one of the major changes being um, when it changed course from previously the, the river actually um, veered here to the west and emptied into the Santa Monica Bay here. Um, and following the 1825 flood, uh, the main, um, the main line of the LA River actually is uh, was redirected to the south, which is more the the pathway that that we see today. Um, so then, kind of what followed was a series of some pretty large and devastating flood events. Um, we have one in 1914, millions of dollars of damages throughout um, throughout the watershed and on the LA River. Um, followed up, uh, th there were a series of these, I don't have them all listed, but kind of culminating with the 1938 flood. Um, this was a really large scale, large scale flood event that affected much of the watershed um, and much of the region. And so we have, you know, $78 million in damages, it says there, I believe that's in 1938 dollars. Um, and then, you know, dozens of people, dozen of dozens of casualties uh, as a result as well. And so this flood, as well as, you know, the other floods that took place throughout the 1930s, um, really kind of was the culmination and spurred the channelization of the LA River. Um, and that was led by the US Army Corps of Engineers. And so that took place from 1938 to 1960 was the completion of it. And so I just have a snapshot here in this picture, um, you can see, uh, you know, this is like the engineered channel that we're kind of used to today. Um, uh, you know, engineered side slopes, concrete bottoms and portions, um, and, you know, constrained, and it's constrained to its banks, whereas you see in the 1938s flood where it broke out of its banks and, and flooded a good portion of the surrounding communities. Um, also just wanted to highlight during this period from 1920 to the 1950s, we have, you see all these different um, flood, flood risk reservoirs coming online as well. Um, so all of this was done, of course, and uh, these, these reservoirs are located in the, the headwaters in the upper LA River watershed. Um, so, you know, all of this was in, a, in an effort to re reduce the flood risk for these downstream communities. Um, and so fast forward from 1960, another 50 years, we have the feasibility study, which was completed in 2015. That's the one that Ruben mentioned he worked on. Those different alternatives were, um, were studied. Uh, one was picked as the, you know, the chosen alternative. Obviously public comments came in. And so fast forward another five years, we have um, in 2020, we, we actually kicked off the, what is the ecosystem restoration we called it the design build study. So it's the design study where we actually are moving forward with the design um, of that chosen alternative. Um, so that's kind of where we're at now. Um, yeah, so that's a brief history <laughs> of it. And so I'm gonna turn it back over to Ruben to kind of talk more about the, um, the actual, the, back, the background of the project and the feasibility features. All right, <clears throat> thank you very much, Lauren. So a little background. Um, the LA River Ecosystem Rest Restoration Project here, as it's mentioned, is located here in Los Angeles, California, um, along the L LA River. Um, so this project, um, you can kind of see that green circle, that's kind of the location of the project. Um, it extends for about approximately 11 miles. It spans essentially from the city of Burbank in the north um, through um, about downtown Los Angeles and just for your reference, the Los Angeles River here is essentially flowing from north to south, kind of top to bottom. Next slide. Um, 
So this 11 mile stretch of the ecosystem restoration project, it, it was kind of decided it would be broken up into, we defined it into eight reaches. And these reaches numbered one through eight, that's what we called them. And the, uh, reach one is located on the upstream end and reach eight is located on the downstream part of the project. All right, <laughs> next, next slide, please. All right, um, so the LA River, um, it's primarily a trapezoidal or rectangular um, configuration with concrete side slopes, concrete invert. Um, however, um, there are two main stretches within our project that don't actually have concrete inverts. Um, you, you, we can see that shown there in those black, in the black there in the map. Um, so these non-concrete um, inverts, or I guess essentially sometimes we call them soft bottom channels, have essentially either grouted riprap side slopes or concrete slab sidewalls. Uh, next one. All right, so our we're gonna talk about our restoration features by reach. Um, we're gonna kind of go through each reach and highlight uh, what's happening. Um, kind of a little virtual flyover with some um, artist renditions and vision of what the uh, river restoration and the river would look like. So let's head over down to reach one. Um, so reach one there, you can see it's kind of a little purple reach. Um, in reach one, there's actually no modifications in the channel. Um, reach one is really gonna focus on the re restoration of the riparian habitat quarters on the outside of the channel. Um, if you look in the bottom left corner there, we can see we've got a little Google Earth of kind of the current conditions of what's out there. And then in the top right, you can see what, what would the restoration of that right prairie habitat could be imagined. So you can kind of see it's kind of kind of brown on the bottom left, you know, a little greener on the top right photo. Let's head to reach number two. Uh, reach two here is going to be a little that orange section there. And what we're going to do is it's also a focusing on restoration of that riparian habitat quarters outside of the channel. And what we're also going to do, do is we're going to change the channel configuration from trapezoidal to rectangular. Um, so in the bottom left corner there is kind of we're standing here on the bridge and we're looking downstream at kind of the current conditions, the pre-project conditions there. You can, I think what's kind of stands out really is those concrete side slopes. Um, in the top there, you, um, the top right photo, or kind of the photo of, of what we could look, what it could look like. Um, we adding some vegetation, uh, maybe some vines hanging along the walls there. And in order to kind of do that is, is therefore we're kind of changing that from a trap channel to a rectangular channel to help provide that um, additional conveyance to account for the um, uh, vegetation. Uh, reach three. Um, reach three, uh, again, just a lot of restoration of the riparian habitat quarters outside of the channel. Um, we're going to kind of, we're going to develop a side channel that will essentially take some of the flows offline of the main channel. And then I believe have some vegetation, maybe marshlands, and then bring it back into the, the channel there. Um, we're all going to also um, do some daylighting of storm drains. And in the next reach, we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, uh, about that. Um, here at Reach 3, you'll see we actually have a um, confluence from the LA River. So we have the main LA River and we have a tributary called the Verdugo Wash, which flows um, east to west. And it's really flowing essentially right at that 90 degree bend in that river. And so what they're going to do here, what we're going to do is we're going to take Verdugo Wash. It's a concrete, um, concrete bottom channel right now. We're going to change that to a soft bottom. And we're essentially going to open up that confluence. Um, and so if you take a look at that bottom left corner, bottom left image there, it's kind of opening up that confluence, um, adding that vegetation. And the thought is we would essentially make the, on the tributary Verdugo Wash, um, take it about a thousand feet upstream and convert that, that thousand feet, um, to, um, soft bottom. All right. Um, reach four. So reach four, you kind of can see kind of that little dark blue um, uh, reach there showing. Uh, again, we're restoration of the riparian habitat quarters outside of the channels. Um, and we're in a daylight storage drains. Um, so in the bottom left image, there is an example of a daylighted storm drain. 
So our daylighting there is intended to improve our riparian habitat environment of the stream. That, that was previously uh, into, it used to be like a culvert or a pipe. And then by daylighting, we would essentially, by daylighting the storm drain, we're allowing the, um, allowing for an increase of habitat, increasing infiltration and hopefully cleaning the flows through a um, bioremediation process there. And then in just in the top right photo, um, there's actually in that um, kind of just rest kind of rest restoration of the riparian habitat is kind of restoring some of that golf course. I think adding some more habitat there on the golf course along the river. All right, reach five. All right, reach five. Um, reach five here, we're shown in the red. Uh, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna change that channel from that trapezoidal channel to that rectangular channel. And by doing that, we're also gonna essentially develop vegetated terraces along the left, um, left bank. And on the right bank, you know, we're gonna go from a trap channel to a vertical channel. You know, therefore essentially, you know, increasing our storage conveyance or our channel capacity conveyance while also adding some vegetation there. Um, what you'll see here on the, the, the picture there in the bottom left hand, that pre-project condition. And one thing that kind of might stand out there is really, um, is obviously you see the concrete side slopes there and just really the, I would say the urbanization and development right up against the long, and along the river. Um, route six. All right, um, route six, that, that fuchsia color reach there we're seeing. Um, what we're gonna do is um, along the left bank there in that bottom right hand corner image is called a, the Taylor Yard or Bowtie Parcel. And we're essentially gonna widen the widen the Los Angeles River to take advantage of that land. And we're gonna kind of restore the riparian habitat along the, along the river, along the sloped walls of that widened channel. And so you can see that's just that image looking downstream. We can see opening up that channel and creating um, more um, riparian habitat. Reach seven. All right, reach seven. Well, the gold color looking reach there in your image there. Um, it's again, a restoration of that right, right here in habitat corridors. Um, so along the right bank, we're gonna terrace the right bank and do some daylighting of the storm drains. Um, and the top, and the image on the top right um, is the um, confluence of the Los Angeles River and another tributary called the um, Arroyo Seco. And it's what we're planning to do is kind of restore the right here in habitat along the Arroyo Seco channel by uh, um, removing the concrete and reconfiguring the, reconfiguring the cross section. So the top right image is kind of like what the road cycle could look like. And in the bottom right is kind of like what we see it now. Um, you can see it's, it's a concrete channel. Um, and in the, in the bottom left image there um, is where we plan to kind of terrace that right bank. So kind of open it up. Um, reach eight. All right, uh, so reach eight, that's the last part of our reach along the Los Angeles River and that's a little green section. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do some terracing of that right bank and essentially um, add like vegetated terraces. And the left bank, what we're gonna do is we're gonna reconfigure the, the channel to take advantage of that parcel. And so with that little kind of that green marker in our main map there, we're, we're essentially what we wanna do is we wanna on the left bank construct a bench that would allow fairly frequent flow. So it's just along the LA River to flow into that area and hopefully develop some marshlands, marsh vegetation that we see there in the um, image there in the bottom left. So those are kind of just a little summary, a little flyover of the eight reaches. Um, I'm gonna pass it back to Lauren to kind of talk about some of the H&H &H, uh, work. Thanks Ruben. Um, so a first step was uh, a little bit about the hydrology of the LA River. Um, so you can see here we, we have kind of the, the topography of, of our watershed and kind of zoomed in. This is the, the reach we're actually designing. Um, so we have a very um, Mediterranean climate here, of course. Um, Pretty dry summers and mildly wet winters. Uh, average precipitation is only about 17 inches. Um, so the watershed up to for the LA River in the upper part that we're concerned with is about 600 square miles or 1,500 square kilometers. Um, 
And so part of the effort for the hydrology portion of this um, was, uh, you know, we wanted to, we did the, the modeling, the hydrologic modeling and the HEC's hydrologic modeling system, um, HMS. Um, and so we were able to bring in quite a bit of data. Uh, there's a lot of data in the LA River watershed to get a, a well calibrated model and validated model. Um, for the, we, as, the, as I mentioned, those, those six reservoirs we have up here in our, um, mostly in our, you know, mountainous, mountainous headwaters, um, we were able to utilize um, the, res the HEC's reservoir simulation um, to kind of take care of those more complex reservoir operations. Um, and then finally, um, we wanted to uh, update the, the, the flood frequency estimates for, you know, these key computation points uh, and especially the tributaries um, coming into the LA River. And so where appropriate, we were able to make use of the updated Bulletin 17C methodology. Um, with the SSP, the HEC's um, statistical software as well. So that's kind of like a, a real quick snapshot of, of, the, of the hydrology um, update that we did for the, for the ecosystem restoration. And then next, a little bit about the hydraulics. Um, so the, the baseline, the hydraulic modeling is kind of just kicking off um, or, you know, I guess I guess it's been underway for a while, but they're finally going to be starting to get some results soon. But uh, we're doing this baseline hyd hydraulic modeling um, with we're going to do, of course, like with and without project. Um, the main goal here is making sure that any of these ecosystem restoration features are not adversely impacting our flood risk reduction authorization. Um, that is the, the top priority, life safety um, for the surrounding communities. That's the top priority um, for the Corps of Engineers. So we wanna make sure that that stays, um, that stays intact. So there's gonna be both two-dimensional, um, there's gonna be two-dimensional um, ADH modeling for the, 11, the entire 11 mile reach and then at select confluences, um, there'll be three-dimensional modeling, um, particularly at the Arroyo Seco confluence, um, just because of some of the flow complexities there. And also, uh, we were able to make use of a some physical modeling results, um, and that kind of helped us uh, kind of validate the results of the numerical model uh, that we have. And so this is just kind of showing like, you know, obviously we're going to be, once we have the baseline modeling, we'll move on to the width project modeling um, in, our, in our hydraulic models uh, to see what the impacts are. And that's all I have. So yeah, just wanted to thank everyone very much. Thanks for having me and Ruben here to talk about this. All right. Well, thanks a lot. It's good to see the updates on that. Um, and what we'll be discussing during the Q&A time is uh, some of these challenges, you know, between the hydrology, the hydraulics, the water quality, the sediment transport, the debris. Um, some of those things are uh, very tough challenges to try to uh, navigate when you have multiple stakeholders and, uh, you know, quite a bit of flood risk. So um, thanks for that. Um, keep your questions. Anybody who's got questions about that, we went big scale first, large scale, um, very challenging um, project, very expensive project. Um, and and a very long term, decades long, these uh, plans have been, uh, you know, discussed and batted around and, it, you know, it takes a while to get these things implemented. Um, now what we're going to do, keep those questions coming in the background um, to uh, to our other presenters, but now we're going to bring Brad on and have him talk about a, uh, a little bit smaller scale, um, perhaps more uh, implementable uh, for councils and for hydraulic engineers, um, you know, who are working on these projects and uh, give us a little bit of an Australian perspective on things. And, and, um, how we've done things, how we can learn some of these lessons from these other projects internationally, and um, you know what we might be able to do going forward, uh, joining forces with uh, water experts like you all attending today. So over to you, Brad. I can see your screen just fine. Cool. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, definitely implementable because all the all the uh, case studies that I'll, I'll show today have all been done, uh, and they're all from Australia. So uh, well done, Australia. Um, but look. Uh, 
there's lots of examples, but there's certainly a lot smaller scale than the LA River has to be said. Um, first up, um, I wanted to show uh, a project that's been around for a long time. Uh, this is the uh, now the Bowie's Flat Wetland in, in Cooparoo in Brisbane. Uh, you can see the photo on the left. That's from the, I think, somewhere in the in the 1990s, uh, courtesy of my colleague Tony Weber from Alluvium. Uh, that used to be a concrete channel uh, right through an urban environment. Uh, apart from being an eyesore and uh, visually unattractive, it was really unsafe because kids would try and cross the concrete channel uh, to get from one side of the park to the other. Um, but they turned that into a big wetland. So this treats, receives water from a very large catchment, um, but you can see the wetland on the right-hand side. So that's the uh, inlet zone or the sedimentation basin and low flows go through the macrophyte zone, high flows bypass uh, via the bypass channel. But clearly uh, proofs in the pudding, uh, a significant improvement to the previous concrete channel uh, project by Brisbane City Council paid for by, uh, I'm assuming just council uh, monies. Uh, but certainly great outcomes, great water quality, great aesthetics, improved ecological values. Not perfect, uh, but certainly better than what it was. Uh, sim similarly, this is a project I was involved in uh, a few years ago is out at Ipswich or Red Bank Plains. Um, the photo on the left basically shows the site in its, pro in its previous glory. And basically we just diverted some water into it and created a wetland. The wetland um, it treats water and we also pull water out of it to irrigate the local park space. Um, this is a detention basin as well. So it solved a whole bunch of flooding dramas in the local area. But clearly dig a hole, fill it with water um, and a good outcome, I believe. Um, another ex similar example, White Seal, um, people in Brisbane might be familiar with this site, um, back of the uh, White Seal Reserve. Previously a fairly weed infested uh, area, it dug a hole, filled it with water. Um, not, a, not a channel naturalization project, but certainly shows, I guess, a small scale uh, at what what can be done uh, when you add plants and some water. Apologies for my voice is a little bit croaky. I'm just getting over some laryngitis. So uh, apologies for uh, my uh, 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 imperfect tones this morning. Uh, another example uh, in Brisbane, um, the photo on the left, this is Eckerman Park East. Um, it was basically a fairly incised channel uh, immediately adjacent to a, uh, a very popular sporting uh, oval. Uh, a whole bunch of soccer activities happened there. Long story short, we basically widened the channel um, and vegetated the banks and it's used to treat water and also um, water is harvested from that uh, wetland environment. This is a, uh, um, a very early uh, photo. It's a, a lot more established since then, um, but obviously a uh, fairly incised channel uh, previously uh, and basically widened the channel, vegetated the banks a bit more and uh, used to irrigate the local sporting oval uh, to provide um, water to, um, to keep the green, uh, keep the grass uh, nice and lush. Uh, this, this is a more recent example. This is, um, and people in Brisbane may be familiar, or certainly probably would, would be familiar, particularly if you're an engineer or a stormwater professional. Um, Hanlon Park in Greenslopes basically took a, uh, a concrete drain and ripped it up and turned it into a natural waterway feature. Uh, so you can see kind of what it looked like previously. Uh, engineers would be crying into their concrete over this one, digging up a concrete channel. Uh, and this is a photo on the right-hand side fairly soon after it was, um, I guess, naturalized. So you can see pool riffle systems, vegetated banks, um, you know, uh, recreational infrastructure in terms of viewing areas, uh, walkways, a lot of opportunities for uh, kids to integrate, interact with the water. Um, etc. And it's a very, very popular area um, on a on a summer's day in Brisbane, I can assure you. So yeah, obviously the proof's in the pudding, great outcome. Uh, another uh, very well-known example in Southeast Queensland, at least, this is a small creek. Uh, it's a 1.7 kilometre stretch of concrete drain uh, that was basically naturalised. So the before photo, before aerial photo on the left, um, you can see the sort of works uh, boundary shown in the red uh, through here. So it's a 1.7 kilometre uh, concrete drain. And this is like a conceptual diagram, but to show you some photos, uh, and uh, you can probably say a picture paints a thousand words. Um, look, it's debatable. The engineers of the world might be um, thinking the, on the photo on the left um, is far better, but I think 99.999% of the population would think the photo on the right is a far better outcome. Obviously, improved uh, hydrology, you know, that vegetation, that, those pools, the riffles, et cetera, are going to slow the water down, promote sedimentation, filtration, biological uptake, obviously aesthetic amenity, um, ecological values, clearly a better outcome.
and that was a project um, done by Ipswich City Council. Um, uh, another example, and I know, uh, shout out to Tim Fischera from Bundaberg Regional Council, who this is, this is his baby. So uh, uh, hello, uh, Tim, and thanks for the photos. This is a uh, before and after aerial photo from near maps. Um, and this is just brand new. Um, so this is um, the, the site. I, I guess a very, very low value uh, rock channel uh, in an urban environment um, in, in Bundaberg. And basically they've uh, naturalized it. So, and this is just a very, very new photo. So you can see the photo on the left, a rock line channel. Um, I don't think anyone thinks that that looks good. Um, but certainly even after, even though the, the works have only been recently completed, uh, the plants have, uh, have undertaken some establishment and are already looking fantastic. And uh, the proof's in the turtle, I guess you'd say. So uh, this is a photo again from Tim um, of a turtle that was uh, found, I think just a few months after the waterway rehabilitation works have been undertaken. So clearly this is a better outcome from uh, an aesthetic, um, ecological values, recreational values, uh, paid for by, I believe, uh, government money and some stormwater quality offset contributions as well. Um, similarly, uh, and it's, I guess we, we, in Australia, we certainly have a lot of these sort of small, narrow, um, straight trains. Um, but this is an example I wanted to show just from WA uh, of basically what can be done to some of these boring, uh, straight, incised drains, essentially just naturalizing it. And so this is a fairly old project. That's a photo from, I think, on the right from um, about 10 or so years ago. So um, obviously, clearly good outcome. Uh, more recently, this is a uh, this is probably more akin to the LA River project that was talked about before. This is of the banks of the uh, Cooks River in Sydney. I think it's the, the most polluted river in uh, in Australia. Um, I think this might be the river that um, Bo Rivers uh, floated down and did his documentary on. Oh, this one on the George's River. I can't remember. Uh, but anyway, it took a eight hundred and something meter um, length of um, channel, and they had to. The, the concrete um, banks were sort of uh, degrading and needing repair anyway. So um, there was decided to basically nat naturalize them, rip out the concrete and put some, uh, I think, sandstone blocks in some parts and a whole bunch of vegetation. Um, great outcome. Um, look, and look, I guess the, the proofs in the pudding, uh, the potential benefits are pretty obvious from the photos I've just shown before, but obviously improved ecological values, amenity, uh, there's obviously uh, improved recreational values of these areas. In many, in many cases, they are much safer uh, assets uh, for the public, obviously improves livability and wellness and sense of place. And it, it probably wouldn't be a surprise that the property values uh, adjacent to some of these areas um, would benefit greatly as well. That's all the good stuff. Um, but as some or many people have already raised in the chat uh, already, there are some challenges. Um, clearly, you know, it's, it's often cheaper just to leave the concrete channel as it is. Um, doesn't cost anything to just basically do the status quo. It doesn't cost anything often to to mow a, a concrete uh, channel, so that's a good thing from a from a I guess a, a local government perspective. But to do something different does cost money, not just in capital uh, investment, but operation maintenance costs as well. Um, you now these assets, if they're vegetated, they do need some maintenance. Probably not excessive, but it certainly needs some maintenance expenditure, and obviously sometimes the costs uh, can be quite high. The Cooks River example I showed before, I think for 800 and something metre length of um, channel uh, bank stabilisation works, it costs about $5 million as one example. Uh, people have already raised in the chat, uh, hydraulics are a key issue. If you change the channel uh, in any way, it's going to uh, impact hydraulics. So it could, uh, the, the most simple, uh, I guess, outcome would be if you just flatly just roughen up a channel its conveyance ability will be reduced so subsequently the there is an increased risk of potential risk of flooding upstream so obviously there's a whole bunch of um, um, hydraulic assessments etc that need to be undertaken to make sure that that um, potential increase in flooding isn't uh, excessive or inappropriate or isn't going to affect property and, and people as well the safety that's a key issue. Like whilst we're sort of often making these uh, environments safer, sometimes there are introduced uh, safety hazards. 
I mentioned the uh, Hamlin Park project before, for example, that has still receives uh, a whole bunch of dirty water from the upstream urban environment, which can contain a whole bunch of very nasty contaminants that can make people sick or, uh, or injured or, or whatever. So we've got to make sure that if we are encouraging interaction within the waterway, we've got to make sure that the, the, the water quality is appropriately safe and not going to cause any, any harm. Obviously, again, if we interact with encouraging interaction, you know, people can still, um, there's obviously an increased risk of say drowning, um, trip hazards, um, you know, it's very easy to slip on a rock, for example, or, or just otherwise just split up, split, you know, fall, split your head open, whatever. So when we're encouraging people to, to come into these you know, water, waterway environments, for example, we do need to be mindful of actually minimizing those risks appropriately. The most simple thing would be, okay, if I've, if I've got a water, like in, in Bell Eden, for example, densely vegetated banks to, to minimize, um, you know, someone just wandering in or falling in or a pram rolling into a waterway environment, obviously giving the ability to, for people to get out if they uh, accidentally fall in as well. Uh, also, uh, erosion. Uh, we've got to recognize that um, concrete uh, uh, has a much lower erosion risk than, than dirt, mulch and plants. So I used the, I showed the Ekeben Park example before um, and, and full disclosure, that was a project that I worked on and, and my company was sued by council. Uh, they, they thought that the, um, the channel, there was a, an erosion issue, uh, erosion sort of incident uh, in the water, in the wetland after it was first built. Um, there's a long story behind that, but, um, and when I spoke to the, uh, uh, the client contact there, they, they said to me, they wanted something rock solid that was Im immune to any sort of erosion hazard. And I, and I basically flatly said, if you want uh, zero erosion risk, you can't do that with plants and mulch and dirt. If you want zero erosion risk, stick to concrete. Um, so we've got to recognize that, yeah, there is a, a, an increased erosion risk and to, and to try our best to minimize that, uh, that risk accordingly through you know, hydraulic assessments, making sure there's appropriate stabilization, vegetation cover, et cetera. The key risk, risk that happened at Eckerman Park was that they constructed it during um, Southeast Queensland wet season, completely opposite of what we actually recommended. So again, there's, there's risks that need to be appropriately managed. And lastly, uh, and, and full disclosure, I work for a company that stops pollution going to waterways. Um, pollution is still a, a key challenge. You know, if we are if we are creating a, a naturalized area as opposed to a concrete channel, there is a significantly um, higher likelihood that pollution will accumulate in those waterway environments. A concrete drain is fantastic for getting water and pollution away somewhere else, uh, downstream into the downstream river, ocean, et cetera. Um, when we naturalize that, that waterway, we certainly slow the flow down. We, we enhance sedimentation, we enhance filtration. So subsequently pollution will have a higher likelihood of accumulating in those environments. So there's two options. We make sure that we have an, an appropriate uh, regime to remove that pollution every so often. But secondly, and this is my preference, is to try harder to stop that pollution from getting into the waterway in the first place. And obviously there's a whole bunch of ways you can do that, whether it be um, underground storm treatment assets like GPTs, gully baskets, cartridges, et cetera. Um, and also the more softer approaches, you know, bioretention systems, swales, wetland sedimentation basins. But wherever we put upstream, obviously they need to be appropriately designed, uh, installed and um, appropriately managed. This pollution does not naturally or magically disappear. But look, whilst I'm sort of harping on, on the challenges, from my perspective, um, clearly the benefits in many, many, many ways uh, will invariably outweigh the, uh, the, the, the risks. And so I'd, I'd love to see more of these projects happen um, across Australia and, and obviously beyond. And that's, that's me for the time being. I'm happy to, uh, I think we're going to dive into questions now. We yeah, we certainly will. Um, there's been a bunch coming in for you uh, oh, while good. you've been talking. So <laughs> if you can have a look, we'll give your voice a break uh, with the laryngitis sure. or what you've got going on there. Yeah. But your voice is coming through just fine. Uh, I love your delivery. Um, thanks for that. And again, uh, if you want more of Brad, uh, tune into his podcast. Um, you'll get more of this, uh, th th these these types of insights um, into the risks and the rewards of um, you know saving our oceans, saving our waterways. Um, so while Brad is taking a look at uh, the questions that have rolled in for him in the meantime there have been quite a few uh for our other presenters um on the um 
on the, on the LA River restoration project, uh, primarily around the hydrology and hydraulics issues. Um, so yeah, if you guys can turn your screens back on again, your videos, um, we'll just get on for a panel discussion here. And um, so Lauren and Ruben, uh, I know you've been busy answering some questions in the background, rather than me selecting the ones um, and, and asking you the questions here live, I think what I'll do is just uh, leave it to you um, to uh, just choose some of the ones that you've been answering and um, perhaps those that have been the most upvoted and then just give us a bit of a, uh, you know, your insights. Uh, just keep in mind that um, everybody on this webinar attending live um, can see these uh, questions and answers. Those watching the YouTube recording later on will not be able to see that. So um, I would ask if you just uh, kind of restate the question for everybody and then just let us know how you have responded. Uh, so let's go back in order. Let's go Ruben uh, first and then over to, to Lauren. So Ruben, I see you've answered a few. Um, go ahead and uh, um, give, give, give us a few of your insights on uh, some of those responses. Okay, um, I'll answer one question. I'll read off the question. This was from Anita. Um, she's asking, though, know, changing, changing from a trapezoidal channel to a rectangular channel and putting vegetation just on the outside, um, why did we, you know, not naturalize a channel uh, or no longer have a rectangular channel either? Um, so I think one of the things we looked, if I recall, that we looked at the feasibility study is, you know, in order to really make the whole thing essentially non-concrete to make it natural, I think the channel itself would have to be, I want to say maybe three or five times wider. Um, and one of the, one of the, one of our constraints, you know, is this is highly urbanized and, you know, everything is right, built right up along the channel. So um, I think that's, that's one of the, I think one of the constraints we had was, you know, how can we kind of, you know, do this ecosystem restoration working within our space, so. Yeah, and I think, and it scales down. I mean, um, you know, there, there hasn't been enough money to go in and just take all these grand plans and implement them, but there has been a lot of uh, effort, time spent and uh, money expended on these studies that have looked at the hydraulics, looked at these trade-offs and other projects around the world, um, you know, that uh, can benefit from some of the results of this um, and some of the outcomes and and perhaps um, where applicable, uh, implement some of these same sorts of uh, solutions. And again, like Brad has shown, there, there are plenty of these that have been uh, completely implemented. And I hope if we have another webinar like this, I hope these webinars go on for another 10, 20 years. And I hope we have some webinars where we can say, hey, look, here was our, you know, the vision and here it is uh, in the ground um, and, and here's how it's performing. And yeah, maybe we'll get some additional flooding uh, impacts. Maybe Maybe there will be some additional erosion impacts. Each of those, we as a water community, as water professionals, will be learning from. Um, so over to you, Lauren. Um, if uh, if you wanted to have a, a stab at some of the questions, uh, or you know, just just pick uh, probably the most upvoted one um, that you've addressed uh, in the meantime um, for the audience today. Um, over to you, Lauren. Yeah, I saw that um, one that I answered was about um, what I'll read it here um, from Patrick. What local fauna are are you hoping to accommodate via the riparian habitat improvements and how will these be kept safe from road strike? Um, and so there's a variety of local um, species that are looking to be accommodated, both fish species. I would say principally, um, a lot of the, the, the focus has been on certain bird species and, and I listed a few of them, um, but there are, um, and so white pelican, jello warbler, Cooper's hogs, there's a whole list of them. Um, and as, as far as the road strike, there are also, I believe there are some plans for, you know, I forget what they're called, maybe like natural crossing or animal corridors as well. Um, I will say that there was a kind of a related question about the, the fish species um, as well, or as far as, um, um, uh, about possibly, oh, I thought I saw something, someone asking about like fish ladders or, or something helping the fish move as well. Um, some of that is, this is like a, a city, uh, the local sponsor is the city and it's, it's a partnership with the federal government and the city. And so some of those are being uh, addressed separately um, through like the city's, uh, some of the city's plans that they have. Um, and so a lot of our focus, right, especially right now, as since we haven't fully entered the design phase has been on uh, the baseline modeling for the for the H and H as now. So a lot of that will come in um, and be more fleshed out 
fully in design as we see what's you know feasible there. Yeah, right. No, thanks for that. Um, and uh, I, I, boy, I see a lot of action questions. We could let this webinar go on for a whole another hour. What we will do is, um, if any of the presenters can respond to these things in writing, uh, frantically typing as we speak, uh, what we will do and generally do with these is uh, make the PDF version of these uh, questions and answers available to you because we're never going to get through all of these. We've got 20 more open questions here. Thanks so much for your participation. It shows us that this is a great topic um, that we may then be able to address a little more next year. Maybe we do uh, a bit of a longer session um, or a more detailed session on some of the aspects that have been raised uh, with these uh, Q&A questions. Um, Brad, uh, let's give you a chance uh, to respond. If you've had a chance now in yeah. the meantime, the last couple of minutes to have a look at the ones that rolled in during your presentation, um, go ahead and give us some uh, insights on uh, anything you'd like to choose to select um, yeah, uh, look, for, for us to cover. Cool. I'll pick one just general area and I'll let other people respond to other ones. But look, there's been a lot of questions or comments around mosquitoes uh, uh, promoting that or uh, and there is a sort of, a, I guess, a, a concern that uh, when you have a wetland environment or a waterway environment, there's an increased risk of mosquitoes. Uh, that Bowie's Flat Wetland Project I showed uh, earlier, they actually did a, a mosquito assessment. This is going back about 20 something years. And it was led by Margaret Greenway, who's now retired from Griffith University. And they basically showed that there was no higher risk of, um, no higher mosquito populations near the wetland than anywhere else sort of in the, in the nearby area. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, number one, uh, in a wetland environment, like mosquitoes love sort of, I guess, um, stagnant water that doesn't move, but in a, in a, and, and with that, without any predators, but a wetland environment, a waterway environment, down, particularly downstream of a large uh, catchment has a lot of water movement. Uh, so that is essentially the, the antidote for a lot of mosquitoes. Uh, they don't like that. Uh, secondly, is that the, a wetland and waterway ecosystem has a lot of natural mos mosquito pr pr uh, predators, um, which again, reduce populations of mosquitoes. So it's actually it's actually been more or less proven that these wetland and waterway uh, environments uh, do not have any higher risk of uh, mosquito growth than uh, a concrete channel. Uh, and I think there was a comment uh, in one of the in one of the chats that that basically show that the uh, mosquitoes, when they were being observed, were generally as a result of backyard activities. You know, buckets of water, stagnant water in people's backyards, as opposed to the the wetland and waterway environment. So whilst it's a it's a it's a reasonable concern, it's it's generally unjust. Yeah, no good. Um, and and some of these things you don't even think about. Uh, you know, er, initially when we talk about, hey, let's restore this, um, and boy, look at all the um, you know detrimental impacts of a trapezoidal concrete channel. There are some positive impacts of a concrete channel that just it gets rid of everything right away. And say you've say you've got an airport nearby, which we do in many of these. Um, I was working on one restoration job that just got shut down when a military transport plane crashed and uh, lots of fatalities uh, because there was a wetland right next to an airport. And they said, no, let's not bring more uh, you know, uh, wet, wetland habitat um, around these airports. So we've got to consider uh, many, many different factors. And sometimes they're things you haven't thought of. And you look at the pictures, you say, oh, of course, everybody wants this. But no, we don't want fatalities around an airport. No, we don't. So um, we, we've got to weigh all these things out. Um, and everybody on this call, we've got hundreds of water professionals on this call. Everybody knows about some of these trade-offs. And hopefully we can learn from each other um, some of these things we might not have, uh, have thought through. Um, what I'd like to do now, we've got about five minutes to go. Um, what, what I'll do is uh, anybody who needs to run on the hour, feel free. Um, what, what we'll do is have all of our presenters give the, uh, the their closing remarks and maybe address one one more uh, question or just come up uh, with, uh, you know, with your own insights that you'd like to share. What would you like to tell the world today? Um, this will be on YouTube. And they say YouTube is pretty much forever. I don't know how long it'll be around, but you know, years from now, somebody will be able to watch this and call it up. What do you want to tell the uh, future generations about um, urban river restoration, what we can do, how we can help? Um, you know, what are the things that you've learned in your career that you would like to pass along, you know, as a mentor to those uh, coming up through the ranks? Um, and then at the end, when we get through in about five minutes, I'm going to just show a little slideshow of uh, my little journey along the LA River from last week. Um, again, feel free if you need to run, um, but I'll tack that onto the end and show you a couple of cool little sites where we run into some uh, movie star houses and other things like that. But uh, that'll just be a little tidbit I add at the end. I don't want to take away from the discussion time here again because it's been so active. Active. So again, back through in the same order. Let's go Ruben, then Lauren, then Brad. Give us uh, you know, your closing remarks uh, and or interspersed with a question that you've uh, been able to uh, 
uh, answer here and you know your advice for the future here. So over to you, um, Ruben. All right, thanks, Craig. Um, I think there's you know when I was working the feasibility study and doing the review, I think some of this just there's a the challenge of you know trying to meet the different requirements and the constraints. You know, um, we've got you know. This, they built this was authorized and built, you know, for flood risk management. You know, we're trying to kind of restore the river at the same time, and it's just trying to kind of balance, you know, those two. Sometimes maybe competing, maybe sometimes competing things, and then just the constraints. You know, like we're limit, you know, we're limited with what we have. You know, I think if it was a blank slate, it'd be easy, a lot easier to do this. But you know, we've got. I think the biggest thing is there's property development on both sides of the bank. So how can we? How can we best make this, you know, happen within our confinements? So it's it's been good. It's been a challenge, but I've enjoyed, you know, trying to think through that um, during my time working on the feasibility. Sounds good. Um, over to you, Lauren. Yeah, I um, thank you. I would definitely echo what what Ruben said. Uh, the challenge has definitely been balancing priorities and different interests. Um, we have a very engaged uh, public here that live right on the river and want to interact with the river. Um, we also have the, the city as well. And so, you know, the competing interests have been a challenge, but um, I think uh, working with the different stakeholders has actually been good. I mean, um, coming from the course perspective of, you know, flood risk being the, you know, the authorization being the top priority and getting to hear more about, you know, um, also making this a community feature, uh, you know, that the community can interact with because it, it there's so much potential there. So, um, yeah, that's kind of been the fun but challenging part of this. Oh, thanks. No, that's great. Great insights. Um, Brad, uh, wrap it up for us. Oh, look, yeah, look naturalizing these channels and waterways into their former glory is is always challenging uh, and there's a whole bunch of competing challenges costs uh, hydraulics erosion perceptions etc um, but you can see from the pro their project uh, outcomes the benefits massively overweigh any sort of risks and costs and i just love to see more of it uh, our waterways uh, are such amazing features in our in our urban environment and i think in many ways they've actually been neglected and, and treated like sewers and drains and we need to change that uh and, and where, where we actually have reverted them back to um you know natural waterways the outcomes the benefits are just so overwhelming you know people uh love them the community love them the birds the turtles the uh, and all the sort of uh, i guess the urban um ecology love these water, uh, restored waterways so like i said whilst it's challenging i'd love to see more of them and uh, i think we've got all the talent in the world to do it um just need to throw some more cash at it and 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 do more of them yeah, that sounds good. And I think um, I'll echo, you know, uh, the soundbite that you recorded from your last webinar um, at the end of our plastic pollution webinar. I think I'm going to take that and uh, stick it all over the place on the internet because it does kind of sum up some of these challenges and the opportunity and the hope for the future that uh, we do have the collective willpower to uh, to do this um, and to, um, you know, to, to, to make a difference in the world. And so I'll, I will refer you back to that. Please um, do have a look at that um, plastic pollution webinar that uh, Brad was involved in. Um, um, along with uh, Captain Charles Moore and others last month um, that focus on some of these same issues. Now, again, I'll, I'll do a quick um, thing at the end of this after these couple of slides for anybody who wants to hang around, but um, do have a look at um, the, uh, the slides that you'll see here in front of you. Um, there will be a recording link emailed to you. Um, you'll get a certificate of attendance. So these do count for continuing professional development. If you want to do a lunch and learn in your office, you know, um, have at it. Everybody will get their, their certificates uh, for attending and you can get some credits along the way for whatever engineering board or whatever boards uh, certify your continuing feedback. Do fill out the short one minute survey at the end um, and let us know um, what you'd like to see more of. And so you may see a couple of slides then on some of the things coming up. Um, we've got our last rating curve session uh, tomorrow um, that will be available online on demand um, for anybody who wants to catch up on that. And a couple of great webinars coming up to close out the year. Um, do tune in for some of those. We've got some of the world's uh, you know, top experts on bridge modeling. Um, I'm excited to tune in for that one. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll also be talking a little more about waterway health and how it impacts uh, coral reefs at the end to finish up our year. Um, 
at any time you can sign up for the on-demand courses and we do have some standalone courses coming up as well um, and you know we we do want to uh, bring you the material that you want uh, more of for your professional development for your career um, to help out um, you know help make the world a better place in terms of waterways so thanks for your attendance i'm going to now share my screen for anybody who needs to run um, thanks for that um, but i'm going to now share my screen i've, I've just got a single laptop screen because i'm traveling so it might be a little bit clunky uh, but these will be more anecdotes we've had the technical part of the uh, presentation uh, I'll, I'll show you a couple of things i ran into um, in la last week and uh, you know this has to do with the uh, the la river project so i'm gonna uh, go ahead and share this here and um, i'll get this started and you can have a look here at a couple of things that I wanted to to highlight again. What you saw in the background here from Greece and the movies, you know, have a look at this. This is not really much of a uh, healthy screen here. I'm going to turn on my spotlight tool so you can see my mouse moving around. Um, one thing I did want to mention, um, we didn't want to highlight this too much on this call because we got to watch out. We've got Corps of Engineers people involved. Um, there there is a you know a group that kayaks the river. Have a look at the uh, movie Rock the Boat. Um, it gets into the politics. This is complex politics. You know, the Corps of Engineers is, uh, generally has only had a jurisdiction over navigable waterways. So if you can navigate a waterway in a canoe, in a kayak, does that make it navigable? Um, this was a bit of a, a, a contentious issue a few years back. And um, I, I would encourage everybody to have a look at some of those articles. Um, I'll post some links to some of these, you know, see where you stand on that. Um, should we, uh, you know, be going in and, and, and should the Corps of Engineers have jurisdiction over, uh, you know, the waterway here? Should the Environmental Protection Authority, what, um, you know, what, what sorts of, um, you know, protection should be in place for an urban waterway? So I would encourage you to do that. Now, I, I went up to the headwaters, um, went to a couple of sites because we're using some of these for our case studies for some of our hydraulic modeling courses. Um, this is up where the um, Little House on the Prairie set was filmed, um, Walnut, uh, Walnut Grove. And uh, if you turn around and look the other way, um, if you flooded out Walnut Grove, um, which is right next to a big waterway, um, that there is the swimming pool that freaked me out when I was 12 years old and I went to go see Poltergeist. So um, watch out for that. That's right along that same river. E.T.'s house um, as well, just right up um, uh, adjacent to this waterway here. Uh, what I wanted to talk about a little bit here is that when you get into the, um, the upper reaches of what drains into the L.A. River, um, there's a lot of debris and sediment coming out of it. And sometimes you need basins to clean that out first because you don't want this stuff settling out in your urban channels and then causing flooding um, where you've got a lot of monetary damage. So a lot of these things, a lot of these washes, um, you've got to collect some of the uh, debris as it comes in. Um, and this is up by ET's house right there. Um, if I turn around and look the other way, uh, that's ET's house right there. And right in their backyard is that gulch that goes down into the, uh, uh, and, 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 and feeds down into the, uh, the from, from the headwaters um, after you've removed some of the sediment. Um, right here, I went on a little movie tour here and that little storm drain back there. Um, if you've ever seen the Burning Man in the Wish You Were Here album, cover um that's the storm drain that he's standing next to um if you ever seen um john cusack holding up his uh ghetto blaster he stood right there you thought it was outside um his uh girlfriend's home at the time no they filmed it out here right next to this wash here and have a look at some of these uh you know these constraints uh look at universal studios there's the la river coming through um this little uh clock tower um you can actually see the clock tower from uh, uh, the Back to the Future movie set there as well. And this is what it looks like. Universal Studios right up on the side there. Um, and then this is the channel where the kayakers went down. And storm drains coming in from that Wish You Were Here set as well. You know, what's the wa urban waterway health? You, you see the people driving on the side of this thing in the movies. Well, this is the rectangular reach that we talked about. Um, not quite drivable. Right up here, the Brady Bunch house. Um, oh, let me go back to that clock tower there again. There's the LA River right there. And that's the clock tower that you see with Marty McFly. So a lot of famous uh, sets over here. This one as well. You wouldn't know the Brady Bunch house right there. That's the tr uh, car parked right outside the Brady Bunch house. Their backyard is the L.A. River. And we've used this uh, in a couple of our uh, tutorials um, for modeling bridge piers and things like that and levees around the Brady Bunch house. I would like to make things a little bit fun with some of these things. Uh, this is where the Terminator um, comes crashing his truck right through here and then traces the motorcycle right down this channel. That's a tributary of the L.A. River. And it looks like this. It's half and half. We talked about trapezoidal and rectangular. Here we have a reach where it's half and half down at the outlet. That's what I just wanted to show in the, fi the final uh, bits here. It comes out in Long Beach. We've got the uh, Queen Mary uh, ship there. Um, this little contrail right there, that's the SpaceX rocket taking off. I got to see a launch 
just by chance, but was out there um, looking at Captain Charles Moore's uh, facilities right here. This is uh, in Long, uh, Long Beach, where the LA River mouth is, and some of these plastics here as well that, uh, that they've collected. You can bring your own plastics into here and recycle them uh, in his Long Beach uh, area facilities. The ocean cleanup is out there in Bologna Creek as well. I went to have a look at their interceptor. Um, again, these are things that, um, you know, we, we, we'd like to clean up these uh, urban waterways, but a lot of this, a lot of when this comes into play is during these massive flood events. Uh, and so sometimes you can't plan for those. In your day-to-day -day events, maybe you don't have enough pollution, you know, that, that, that you'd even be able to pick something up, but will you be able to pick it up during these big floods that expand out into areas where people have not been cleaning out their waterways? And those blasts can be um, massively significant in terms of the load of plastics and other pollution that comes down and affects the health of our waterways and of our oceans. I will include a couple of links um, to some uh, in, in, in the notes here to some uh, video presentations where we um, I've gone through and um, and and mapped out uh, with uh, with uh, different movie sites here that are along some waterways. Um, we've gone and used these for some of our tutorial models. If you're interested in seeing any of these, um, I've got a couple of videos um, where we uh, flood Hollywood and we bring in a tsunami over the uh, Santa Monica Pier, and then we come in and um, you know try and protect some of the homes uh, that are familiar. Um, in some various uh, various movie sets. So I've got a few of these videos online and I'll include some links to these um, where we can go in and, and have a look at um, all the Casablanca sets. Um, I've got a few of these here um, where we go in and that's the, there's the Bewitched House and uh, the uh, Wisteria Lane from Desperate Housewives and other things like that. Um, and there's the LA River going right through the middle of some of these and we go through uh, on some of these videos and flood uh, flood a few of these familiar sites um, because it just uh, you know again if you've if you're familiar with some of these sites and uh, you get into some hydraulic modeling um, that can help um, you know that that can help uh, uh, make things a little more interesting and keep people a little more engaged while we're learning about some of the trade offs between hydraulic modeling hydrology water quality uh, sediment transport and some of those things so a couple of the things that we've flooded here. Again, this is that park, that wash that I was standing by, and we've let some of the overflow go out there. And finally, closing it off um, with Star Wars. And this is where they built the, uh, uh, the Star Wars um, movie set there. And um, we, can, we can come along. <laughs> we've got the Friends Fountain and a couple of other interesting things right along the side here. Uh, this is in uh, a little farther to the south, uh, but we have some fun with it. So if you want to join in on any of our courses, that is perhaps a uh, shameless plug on my end for um, some of the things that we do with the Australian Water School. Um, we do want you to have fun with it. Um, this is an exciting, you know, it's an exciting career in, uh, you know, for water professionals. Um, we want you to make the most of it. We don't want you to get bored out of your minds. Um, you know, some of the technical elements can get a little tedious. We've gone through and covered all the St. Benon equations and everything else in our courses, but we want to intersperse it with something that's a little bit interesting as well. And I think with our speakers on today, you know, we've been able to do that. So thanks for those who stayed on an extra 10 minutes to watch my little uh, slideshow of a uh, bit of a, a trip up and down the LA River. Um, it is something that um, you know I've, I've been involved with for some years. And um, you know, my very first job straight out of school was trying to see how do we put parapet walls up on the side of the LA River to get more water through. And then that morphed into, you know, over the next decade, that morphed into some of these restoration projects where we had some awesome looking animations. And I always wondered what's gonna happen. Are we gonna be able to actually implement some of these? And interesting to see with some of these constraints, um, it's, it's not so easy. So I would like to thank all of our presenters coming on today. They came on as volunteers. Um, I came on as a volunteer today. This is, um, you know, these are free for you, um, free to attend and unpaid for those who, uh, uh, who do this out of the goodness of their hearts or um, also to, you know, we, we do want to uh, make sure that you have the resources available um, and uh, let, let you know, um, you know where, where we might be able to focus some efforts. But I want your feedback as well. We do want to hear from you. you know, is this the type of content you want to see next year? Um, so uh, give us that feedback. Thanks so much for your attendance. Brad, Lauren, Ruben, thank you. And thanks to all the attendees. We'll tune out and see you next time. Thanks, Bye -bye. Craig. Be good. Thanks for watching. Subscribe by clicking the link below and click on the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. For the latest in significant, innovative and critical advances in water science, technology and management, subscribe now to build your skills, enhance your technical knowledge and learn from leading experts in water, 
visit theaustralianwaterschool.com.au and discover our online training courses, both live and on demand.